Hello everyone and welcome to lecture number 17. And my name is Arash Salimi. I'm working with Professor Anand Agarwal at the Ohio State University. I'd like to thank ONR for funding this lecture series on silicon and wideband gap power devices. In this lecture, we're talking about processing of the JBS diodes. As we discussed in the previous lectures, the cross-sectional view of a JBS diode is similar to this. Uh, we have different parts. Uh, first of all, we need a drift layer over, over silicon carbide substrate. Uh, the drift layer thickness is 16 micrometer with a doping concentration of 5.2 E15 uh, per cubic centimeter. In the active area, we have the P plus regions with a width of two micrometers and uh, the distance uh, of 2.5 micrometers. The last P plus region is uh, wider. We need a wider P plus region in the last one. I will explain it uh, in the next lecture where I'm talking about the mass layer design. Uh, in the termination area, we have 46 card rings uh, with the width of 2 micrometer and the distance bet uh, between them is 0.8 micrometer. So the total length of these 46 card rings is 136.8 micrometer with a total spacing of 36.8 micrometer. After the last guard ring with a distance of 15 micrometer, we have a channel stop N plus with a width of uh, 5 micrometer. Uh, in this structure we have two layers of oxide silicon dioxide as the first one and silicon nitride uh, with a with thickness of 1.02 micrometer and half of micrometer the silicon nitride is being used as a moisture barrier so the humidity can humidity cannot reach uh, to the surface of the silicon carbide and then we have seven micrometer polyamide as a dielectric isolation and four micrometer aluminum as a top metal in order to have a good kind of, uh, distribution and spreading over 100 nan nanometer tie as a Schottky contact. In the back side of the substrate, we need an off nick contact, nickel, and then we have a stacked layer of tie nickel silver with 50, 300, and 100 nanometers. The first step of the processing starts with epitaxial growth, where we are uh, growing 60 micrometer with this doping concentration as a drift layer over a silicon carbide substrate. The first mask is alignment mark. We need this alignment mask in order to align the other uh, steps or other uh, masks with the first mask. So. Uh, we can actually put, for example, one uh, shape over another shape with very low misaligning. Otherwise, we'll have very large misaligning and we won't have a good device. So this is the reason that we need to form this alignment mark with silicon carbide dry etching. So if the first step of any device is silicon carbide dry etching, we can form this alignment mark uh, along with this step. Otherwise, we have to add the silicon carbide dry etching for the alignment mark as the first mask. The second mask is forming P plus guard rings. The left hand side over here is the top side of the device and the right hand side is the, is the cross-sectional view. So we have the substrate, the 16 micrometer drift layer or the substrate that we actually have done by the epitaxial growth. And then you can see these P plus regions within the drift layer. <coughs> and the top view here, you can see the P plus regions in the active part over here. Here is the active part, active area. And the termination or the guardings are on the periphery of the active area, as you can see over here. For forming the P plus regions for the 
active area and the termination area or guard rings, we need to implant or forming by iron implantation. For <coughs> any step of uh, these masks, we need photolithography. In the photolithography, we are coating the sample with a photoresist and then by using a suitable mask that we uh, have been and uh, that we have drawn uh, uh, before with uh, some softwares I'm talking about it in the next lecture uh, we can expose the photoresist in some part of the area that we are not blocking the light or UV with the mask so now there are two different types of photoresist, positive photoresist and negative photoresist. In the case of a positive photoresist, the portion of the photoresist that are not blocked with the light are soluble with a developer. So by utilizing a developer, we can remove this portion of the photoresist and then make exactly the same pattern on the mask on the photoresist. Now, since we are going to implant the sample, we need a suitable mask for implantation. For implantation, we can use photoresist as a mask or oxide like silicon dioxide and also metal. So it depends to the energy and the dose of the implantation. For high dose and high energy, we can use metal. Then if we decrease the energy and the dose, we can use the silicon dioxide. And for low energy and doses, we can use photoresist. In this case, we need to use a silicon dioxide since we're going to implant our sample with 360 kV with 600 degrees C. And also, by changing the thickness of the oxide, we can uh, prevent of the dopants for the portion of the, or the some parts of the area that we don't want to have any uh, impurity. So, in, this is the reason that the first step is being started by oxide deposition. So, by calculating the thickness of the oxide that we need for the implantation, we deposited this oxide. And then the second part is the photoresist, as I, uh, the photolithography, as I explained. Coating the sample with photoresist, exposure, and then developing. And then we will have the pattern on the photoresist. And by using this photoresist as a mask, and Sil uh, silicon dioxide dry etching, we can have the same pattern in the oxide as well, as you can see over here. And now we can easily remove or strip the photoresist by oxygen plasma or acetone. And now our mask, silicon dioxide mask, is ready for iron, iron implantation. In the case of P+, Normally, we are using aluminum implantation. And then we can form these regions, the guard rings and the P-plus regions in the active area. And after the implantation, we can remove the oxide by oxide weight etching, like buffer HF. Mass number three is the N-channel stop, N-plus channel stop. And the processing is exactly the same as the previous mass, mass number two for P plus uh, guard rings and uh, the P plus in the active area. Uh, in the case of M plus, for sure we need to implant with nitrogen or phosphorus. The processing is exactly the same, silicon dioxide deposition, coating the sample with photoresist, exposure, developing, and then uh, photoresist stripping and after that we need to dry oxide etching in order to have a suitable mask for implantation as you can see over here again we can use 360 kV at 600 degrees C nitrogen implantation and after the implantation utilizing oxide with etching like buffer HF 
we can remove the oxide. <coughs> now, all these aluminum and nitrogen that we have implanted are not activated, and they cannot contribute electrically. So we need to activate them. One way for activating these impurities is high temperature annealing, for example, 1700 degrees C at argon ambient. But since we are utilizing high temperature annealing, three phenomena can be happen. The first one is migration of atoms on the surface. So if we do the, uh, the high temperature annealing without utilizing any cap layer, uh, and you check the sample with an AFM, you will see a very high roughness due to this migration of the electrons at the uh, uh, migration of the atoms at the surface. The second phenomenon is at high temperature uh, annealing, some silicon atoms can dissolve and go away from the surface. And the third one is impurity out diffusion, especially for lighter atoms like boron, we can see this, for example, boron out diffusion. Utilizing a suitable cap layer, for example, a carbon cap layer or graphite, we can prevent all these three phenomena. For forming this cap layer, we can coat the sample with a photoresist and then anneal it at high temperature. And in this case, the photoresist will change to the carbon cap layer. And now the sample is ready for high temperature annealing in order to have to activate the impurities. So activation annealing. And after the activation annealing, we can easily remove the carbon cap layer by oxygen plasma. The next step of the processing is oxide deposition. As you can see here, it has been shown that a wet oxide growth at 200 degrees C to 1300 degrees C has better result or better quality of the silicon dioxide and also at the interface of the silicon dioxide and silicon carbide. And also it has been shown that if we have 20 nanometers of oxide, we have a lower density of interface states or DITs. So after increasing the 20 nanometers, these DITs are a little bit, uh, are going up. So 20 nanometer is the optimized thickness. So first of all, we grow 20 nanometers with oxide at the interface of silicon carbide. And then <coughs> we need a post annealing at high temperature, 1200 to 1300 degrees C at NO ambient or N2 ambient or even NH3 or ammonia. In order to passivate the surface, we know that there are some dangling bonds, for example. And in these dangling bonds, one electron can sit on the dangling bonds and cause to scattering, electron scattering, because it makes Columbus force to other electrons. And with this scattering, the mobility will decrease, especially at silicon carbide MOSFETs, we can see the channel mobility is much less than the bulk mobility. So by passivating these dangling bonds, we can improve the mobility. So in the case of NO ambient, for example, uh, the NO bond will break and nitrogen can diffuse and reach to the in interface of the silicon dioxide and silicon carbide and passivate the dangling bonds. Also, it has been shown that <coughs> if we use NO ambient, we have lower density of interface states compared to the N2O because the activation, annealing, uh, acti uh, activation energy of NO is lower than N2O. So we need lower energy to break the bond between the nitrogen and oxygen in NO compared to the N2O. After 20 nanometers, oxide growth and passivation. Now we can deposit one micrometer uh, silicon dioxide by PCVD. And then we can densify 
this uh, one micrometer oxide by red oxide growth at 950 degrees C. You may ask, are we increasing the thickness of the oxide by red oxide growth at 950 degrees C? Actually, no, because we have a thick oxide and then it's not possible to increase the thickness of the oxide uh, because the oxygen cannot penetrate and reach to the surface and make more uh, oxide thickness. And then <coughs> after the, this deposition densification, uh, the densification also is better to explain here is due to this densification we will have better quality. We are removing some holes and pores inside the oxide and make better quality of the oxide. By the way, <coughs> after silicon dioxide deposition, we can deposit half of micron silicon nitride as a uh, moisture barrier. Then we need backside metallization where we need an ohmic contact on the backside of the substrate. The first part is photoresist and baking. So we are coating the sample and bake the sample with photo, uh, baking the sample in order to protect the top side. And then we can deposit 140 nanometer, for example, nickel on the back side. And after the nickel deposition, we can strip or remove the photoresist. And then we need to anneal at high temperature in order to have a good army contact. And we can use rapid thermal annealing tool or RTA. Uh, so 950 degrees C in nitrogen ambient for one minute uh, is, could be okay in order to have a good army contact. Mask number four is via, and then metal deposition. As you can see here, we have that oxide everywhere. So we need to etch the oxide on the active area in order to deposit metal over it. So in this case, again, we need photolithography, coating the sample with photoresist, exposing, developing, and then uh, oxide dry etching and then we have this actually via a window in order to deposit tie. One thing that is so important over here is we have to put the sample in an evaporator as soon as possible otherwise we have native oxide over here. So <coughs> by evaporation we can deposit, for example, 100, 100 nanometer tie on the silicon carbide surface and also on the photoresist. And then the next step is lift off. In the lift off, we're putting the sample in, for example, acetone or other solvents in order to dissolve the photoresist over here. And now since the photoresist is going away, there is no seat for the tie over it. And then we have only tie over the silicon carbide. And then we can anneal the sample at 500 degrees C and not more because we need Schottky contact over here. If we increase the temperature, for example, to reach 900 or 950 degrees C, then we have the army contact on the P plus region. And we know that for the JBS, we need Schottky contact. In, in the case of MPS, we need army contact, but in the JBS, just shot key. So 500 degrees C for 30 minutes in a vacuum tube is enough in order to have a good shot key contact over here. Mask number five is over layer metal in order to have a good current distribution and a spreading 
over the sample. Suppose that we are going to put wire, in order, uh, we're going to wire bonding the sample in the packaging. So if the wire bond, for example, is here, we have a resistance between this part to the other part, to the corner, for example, over here, or this part, or that part. So we're going to decrease the resistance by improving the current spreading, and it could be happened by sputtering an overlayer metal as aluminum. So we are sputtering four micrometer aluminum, as you can see here, and then we need a lithography, photoresist coating, exposing, developing, and then we have a good mask in order to etch the aluminum, this part and here, in order to have the overlayer metal or the active area. We can use aluminum with etching in this case, and after the aluminum etching, we can remove the photoresist by acetone. Mask number six is pad opening. This is a cross-sectional view and top view, but one thing that I should explain over here is, on the top view, the red part is the mask, and we're going to remove this part and reach to the aluminum, as you can see here. So, we have polyamide in the pre on the periphery everywhere and not here or here on the aluminum. So it should be noted here. There is no polymer, uh, polyamide on the aluminum or over layer metal. This processing is really easy because we can coat the sample with polyamide, 7 micrometer, and then by utilizing a photoresist over here, we can, uh, we can etch the polyamide after the exposing and developing with the mask of photoresist and reach to the surface of overlayer metal or aluminum. And after this, we can uh, strip the photoresist, as you can see here. So there is no photoresist on the polyamide, and we have reached to the aluminum surface. Finally, similar to the top side, we need an overlayer metal on the back side, where we have only 140 nanometer nickel army contact. So in this case, we can evaporate Thai nickel silver with 50, 300, and 100 nanometer thickness on the backside of nickel in order to have a better uh, current spreading. Normally, silver and gold are being used for the last uh, metal in the last uh, part of this stack layer uh, because we're going to solder the pack, uh, solder the device in a package, and silver and gold are good materials. Uh, gold <coughs> is not oxidized, in, but it's expensive, and we know that the resistivity of gold is better than uh, silver. So, in the case of silver, if we're putting the silver in the in the last layer, uh, we have to uh, be careful in and prevent of oxidizing the silver before packaging. Uh, so normally after the fabrication, suppose that we have a wafer, we're putting the wafer in a vacuum uh, packages, and then we can use the wafer f f after the dicing and, use, uh, and uh, do the packaging. Let's stop here. And in the next lecture, I will talk about the mass layout design uh, of the JBS, silicon carbide JBS dials. Thank you very much for your attention.